Since I know I've not spoken to you, probably most of you before, um, I have a confession to make. I worked for the Internal Revenue Service for 33 years. I know. I know I don't look that dangerous, but, you know, watch out. I'm just saying. But at least at some point in my life, I decided to go from the dark side to, to, the, to the light. How's that? Every time I give a presentation, I always have to start out with an accounting joke. And since I've never spoken to you before, you'll have never heard this before. So a woman goes into the doctor, and he tells her some really bad news. You only have six months to live. And she says, well, doctor, isn't there something you can do to, to help me live longer? He says, well, if I was you, I'd marry a CPA. And she said, well, will that help me live longer? And he says, no, it'll just seem like it, that's all. <laughs> so... This new tax law in 2018, I want to kind of go back to what Lisa said. There was winners and losers in this thing. And certainly when she talked about itemized deductions, many people can't itemize anymore. And, um, and so that's probably not a good thing. And if you live in high income states like California, where they have high income tax and high property taxes, um, you probably didn't come out as well. But there were some good things that happened, especially if you're in business. Okay, and um, anybody ever watch, uh, anybody, any football fans out here? Football? You ever watch Inside the F NFL, Inside the NFL, which is on Showtime every week? You ever watch that? So the first segment on this show every week is what did we learn? Well, the truth is when it comes to this 2018 tax law, we learned a lot. This law was absolutely far more complicated than you think. The IRS, while it had changed the laws, doesn't automatically come out with the regulations on the law. Regulations are basically the IRS interpretation of the law. So we go into this 2018 tax year to do returns, and we have the law, but we don't really have the IRS's interpretation. Now, of course, as your CPAs, whose side do you think we're on here, okay? If there's any ambiguity in the law... We want to certainly lean toward the clients, okay? So let's talk about a couple of my, let's do, let's do the easy ones, the softballs first. How's that? And, um, and the first softball has to do with like-kind exchanges. Now, I don't know how many people have real estate. By the way, I am a licensed broker, so watch out. <laughs> um, like-kind exchanges normally would happen when people would say you want to do a 1031 exchange for investment property. So if you're familiar with that, if you had a, an investment property and you wanted to sell it but defer paying the taxes, you would buy another investment property. And so those type of exchanges are still allowable. But here's one that you probably didn't think of. How about if you have a car and you use it in your business and you trade it in for another car? That used to be considered a like-kind exchange, so there was no tax impact on trading in your car. Well, under the new law, like-kind exchanges only apply just to real estate. So when you trade in your business car now, when we're doing your tax return, we have to trade it as two separate transactions. One that you sold your car for whatever the trade-in would be, and then you bought another car. Um, another, another softball kind of change, I think, which could affect people, has to do with net operating losses. You know, when we would do your tax return, if you had an overall net operating loss, we would decide, you and I, we would decide, well, should we carry this loss back to a prior year in which you actually paid income tax? Or was it not worth it and we would just carry it forward? So that was a conscious decision that you have to make. By default, the law says you carry it back. An election would be we'd carry it forward. Well, the change in the tax law in 18 was is there are no more NOL carrybacks. And that could be significant to big companies who had previously to pay tax in earlier years. Now they have a bad year and they have a loss. Well, in the past, they'd be able to, to get some of that tax back from the earlier year by doing this carryback. They don't have that choice anymore. And so, well, you know, you know, making money is a really good thing and paying tax actually is a good thing. Losses are certainly good for taxes because you tend to pay less tax. Now, let's talk about the big change. And this is where not only is there a little, a lot of strategy that's involved, I can tell you for sure that when we got new clients recently and we looked at their 2018 returns that were done by different accountants, 
you would not believe how many mistakes we saw. Gary, Gary and I, we, we, com well, we compare notes all the time, and I found one, and I think he found one, which, which is about the same, where there was the, the personal tax return was off by $150,000 in tax because they didn't understand how this new provision worked. So this is really easy to make a mistake on this. And the moral, and we'll talk about it in two seconds, but the moral of the story is, and I, we've told clients this for years, when someone's doing your tax return, just because they get a green check in the software doesn't mean the tax return is correct. All it means is it mathematically is correct, but like any other software, it's still garbage in and garbage out. So if you don't know what you're doing and you rely on that software, I can assure you, it's, I don't want to say it's 100%, but there's a great chance that that return may not be right. Either not right because the wrong information was put in, not right because of the strategy that you used, and so uh, there's, more, there's more to do in tax returns than just data input. So let's talk about the big change. It's Internal Revenue Code Section 199A. And basically what it says is that if you're in business, instead of having to report 100% of your income, you only have to pay tax on 80%. So basically they're giving you a deduction for 20% for of, your, of your income, which quite frankly is a really, 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 really good deal. Okay, now going back to the question about estates and how long this will stay into law, who knows? It could change with the next administration, but for, for 18 and for 19 now, that law still applies. So if you made $100,000 from your business, and in the past you had to pay tax on 100,000, now you only gotta pay tax on 80,000. A really, really good deal. There are a couple caveats to this, and this is where the strategy comes in. First off, if you make more than a certain amount of money, there's a calculation that you have to do to determine how much of a deduction you get. And for married filing jointly in 2018, it was $415,000. So if you made more than that, you just don't, didn't automatically get to 20%. There was a calculation that you had to go through and part of it involved how much you made, of course, but part of it involved how much you paid in wages in your company. So there was a minor calculation you had to go through to figure out how much, if not all the 20, how much of the 20 you got. But for the most part, you're going to get something. But then they added another part in. For some reason, they didn't like CPAs and they didn't like attorneys. I'm pointing to him. Okay. What happened is if, you are, if your income is generated from what they call a specified business, if you're an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, for some reason architects must have a good lobby because I think they got exempted. I, I can't figure that one out. But if you, are in one of those, if, if you are in one of those professions, they made it even tougher. And what they said is if you make more than $415,000 and you're a doctor, you get nothing. Boo-hoo. That's all I got to say. Now, one day when I make more than $415,000, of course, then, you know, <laughs> I'll understand the real pain here. But, Gary, I don't make that much yet, so I'm just letting you know. Okay. So, yeah, we have a question. Go ahead. Uh, as far as I know, it is, yeah. I don't think they specify... Yeah. Yes, any marijuana, and by the way, any marijuana questions? <laughs> Come to Lisa. That's right. That's right. I, don't, I always smoke it. I don't know anything about the taxes, okay? <laughs> I'm just a user, that's all. But here's where the, but, oh, one other big factor in this 199. Guess what it also applies to? How about rental property? Do you know how many returns we looked at where they didn't take that deduction on rental property? General rule, if rental property has a gain, you want it to qualify for the 199 deduction. If rental property has a loss, you don't. It works against you. Okay? So their strategy, number one, you have to be able to identify what it applies to. And number two, there could be some strategy involved in how you report your income. So let me give you a great example. Make believe that you're 
a doctor. I won't use attorney. Make believe that you're a doctor and you, and it's make believe you're a chiropractor. It turns out we have a lot of chiropractors as clients. But make believe, now your income is over this $415,000, but as part of your practice, you do more than doctoring. In addition to being a chiropractor, you actually have a, wait, this is the term side hustle. <laughs> you actually do a weight loss. You do vitamins and supplements and stuff like that. That's a whole separate segment of your business. If you split up your income between the chiropractic and the other business, while the income from your chiropractic is not going to help you on that 199 the income from the other business could. So there's a lot of logic, or a lot of strategy, I should say, that you could use going forward to determine, well, maybe we should split up that income into different, into, from different sources, okay? Do we need a separate EIN for the two, or can we do Aaron wants to know, do you need a separate EIN number? Uh, generally, you want them to be separate entities, that's correct, right? Um, because that makes it much cleaner if the IRS comes in and audits you, okay? Remember I mentioned also there was a calculation involving wages. I remember looking at a return where, say, the, the guy made a million two, and my expectation was going to be if you, well, I'll change it to a million because I'm really not good at math. <laughs> say he made a million dollars. My expectation was when I looked at that return, I would see a deduction for $200,000, right? 20% of a million dollars. And he had like $1,000. Well, the reason he had 1000 is because remember I had said if you're over 415 and you're not a doctor, wages are a part of his calculation. He had no wages. Well, here's what I would have done to fix it. I would have given him some wages. And all of a sudden, oh, okay, all of a sudden, then, you know, he would have been entitled to it. Okay, uh, any questions, see me afterward. I know I ran over. I apologize.